evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Day. And I'm Anne-Marie Sim. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Australian leader warns against jumping to conclusions after underwater signals detected possibly from missing plane black box. Mainland scholar raises eyebrows after suggesting trial run of Article 23. U.S. warns China against unilateral action in territorial disputes with Japan. Hopes of finding a missing Malaysian airliner were raised today when Australia announced that one of its vessels picked up a possible underwater signal. But Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott warned against reaching hard and fast conclusions too soon. Up to a dozen search planes and 13 ships headed out this morning to an area where mainland vessel the Hai Shun 1 twice detected signals that could be from missing Malaysia Airlines flight MH370's black box data recorder. Their search focused on three large stretches of ocean about 2,000 kilometers from Perth. China is actively involved in the hunt for the Malaysia Airlines plane because two-thirds of the people on board were Chinese nationals. The man in charge of coordinating the international search from Australia announced today that underwater detection gear towed behind an Australian Navy ship, the Ocean Shield, had also detected a sound. This is an important and encouraging lead, but one which I urge you to continue to treat carefully. Speculation and unconfirmed reports can see the loved ones of the passengers put through terrible stress and I don't want to put any further, uh, put them under any further emotional distress at this very difficult time. So we had uh, a report back from Ocean Shield from the uh, the towed ping locator operators on board there that uh, they had picked up a detection. Uh, they are still investigating that. We are not yet sure whether uh, she'll be tasked to remain there, if it's promising she will, to investigate that particular remission uh, or detection. With just a day to go before the batteries on the black boxes of the missing plane run out, news of signals being detected is being met with hope and scepticism. We are hopeful, but by no means certain. This is the most difficult search in human history. Uh, we are searching for um, uh, a, uh, an, an aircraft <coughs> which uh, is, uh, is, uh, is at the bottom of a very deep ocean and uh, it's a very, very wide search area. So it's a very, very difficult search and <coughs> while we certainly are throwing everything we have at it uh, and while the best brains and the best technology in the world uh, will be deployed, um, we uh, need to be very careful about coming to hard and fast conclusions too soon. Given that the families are still grieving, that they're very anxious, it's a very distressing time for them, I think that we should wait until Angus Houston confirms one way or another as to whether this is um, a lead that we can follow, whether it will change the uh, search and rescue mission in any way. Flight MH370 disappeared en route from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing four weeks ago with 239 people on board. But some relatives refused to believe the plane crashed. A woman whose partner was on the flight suspects the Malaysian government knows more than it's letting on. Sarah Bajak told US media that she and relatives of other passengers are confident that the plane is not only still intact but that everyone on board survived. She and the others are convinced the plane was taken in some sort of military operation. One family member apparently put forward the idea that at some point the jet had been escorted by fighter planes. The plane is believed to have crashed in the southern Indian Ocean, although no confirmed debris has been found. Which has led to an alternative theory that the flight was commandeered remotely and flown to Diego Garcia, a military island controlled and operated by the US and Britain that is believed to be equipped with powerful radar that can spot anything in the region. Adding to the intrigue is the fact that on board were 20 employees of a US technology firm which had just launched a new electronic warfare gadget for military radar systems just days before the Boeing 777 went missing on the 8th of March. Here in Hong Kong, Basic Law Committee member Rao Ge Ping has suggested Hong Kong introduce unpopular security law Article 23 on a trial basis. LegCo President Sung Yok Sing was surprised by the idea, calling it astonishing. Emily Su reports. 
Just two weeks after Basic Law Committee member Rao Geping ruled out civil nomination for chief executive candidates in the 2017 election, the legal scholar is back in the news. In a mainland magazine published today, the Peking University law professor said the lack of anti-subversion laws in Hong Kong is the reason why the city has been seeing challenges to the basic law and China's sovereignty. Rao did not refer to any specific events. Article 23 requires laws prohibiting acts of treason, secession, sedition or subversion. But an attempt to pass it was scrapped after half a million people took to the streets to protest against the idea in 2003. Since then, Article 23 has been twisted, contaminated and demonized, said Rao. But that doesn't mean the plan can just be brushed aside and shelved for good. Hong Kong is obliged to legislate Article 23. We cannot implement it selectively, use it when we like it and dump it on the side when we don't like it. But since Hong Kong is unlikely to pass any anti-subversion laws in the near future, mainland scholars like Rao have been coming up with alternatives. One solution would be implementing national security laws temporarily as a trial, until the SAR government legislates Article 23. Rao said his views don't represent Beijing's, but his remarks raised some eyebrows. Professor Rao's comments are Professor Rao's comments. As someone who has studied the basic law for a long time, uh, it is for Professor Rao to, to explain why that should be so. Zhang described Rao's remark as astonishing and stressed that China's national security law is not included in the city's mini constitution and therefore it cannot be enforced here. As we understand the basic law, of course, um, the only national laws that would apply in Hong Kong are those listed uh, in Annex 3 of the, of the basic law. In response to Rao's comments, the Security Bureau said the current administration is focusing on livelihood and social issues and has no plans to introduce Article 23. Emily Su, ATV News. Health Minister Ko Wing Man hopes a new law to regulate private columbariums could be introduced later this year. He said he hopes it will help wipe out illegal businesses. For a long time, illegal columbariums have not only been a problem for the government, but also residents living near them, who complain about the traffic and environmental and hygiene problems. Some columbariums have been declared illegal by the government, but very often the owners just ignore the warnings. Health Secretary Cohen Mann says currently there are no laws regulating private columbariums and individual government departments can only use their own rules and procedures to regulate such illegal activities. He hopes the private columbaria bill can be introduced in the second quarter of this year to stamp out the problem. Ho said the new legislation which will be rolled out by his bureau will consider several factors including land use purposes, architectural integrity of the complexes and fire safety requirements. He hopes with the bill, it will give the government stronger powers to enforce the laws and crack down on illegal columbariums. Co added that owners will be given time to fulfill the legal requirements they need to carry on. But he stressed that illegal niches in residential blocks will definitely be closed because of environmental concerns. On a separate issue, Ko said a working group at his department is studying whether to change the fixed penalty system for private hospitals. Ko has dismissed suggestions that fixed penalties have failed to act as a deterrent because there are only one of several ways to penalize private hospitals which have made errors. He added that the group is still collecting views before making a final decision. Emergency crews were sent to the waters off Pokfu land this afternoon when a container ship ran aground. Police said the 193-meter-long vessel ran into trouble near scenic villas because of monsoon winds. No one was hurt. The ship was about 100 meters from the shore when it ran aground. Officers planned to tow it to the northwest Lama anchorage. Taiwan's parliamentary speaker Wang Jinping says he will halt a review of a trade pact with the mainland until an oversight bill is passed. His sudden comment sparked outrage in the ruling Kuomintang party, but was seen as a victory for students protesting against the deal.
It's been 20 days since students in Taiwan began the occupation of parliament to protest against a trade agreement with the mainland. Today, Legislative Speaker Wang Jingping made a surprise visit to the compound, the first time since the students took over. He made a brief speech before entering the building. Wang said he will hold a lawmaker's review of the trade pact until an oversight bill passes and also urged the students to end their occupation. Wang then met students inside the chamber. He shook hands with several of them, including their leader Lin Fei Fan, but did not have face-to-face -face talks with him. Wang sent his regards to the students. Lin said students recognize Wang's goodwill and consider his comments the first success from their occupation. But Wang's remarks sparked criticism from members of the Kuomintang party, who said they had been kept in the dark about his moves. They also accused him of betraying the party. Presidential office spokeswoman Li Jiafei said it was not informed about Wang's visit, but supported his advice to the students to go home. The U.S. says it plans to send two more missile defense warships to Japan to counter the threat posed by what it calls North Korea's provocative actions. U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel also warned China against abusing its power in territorial disputes with Japan. Bo Lang reports. U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel today announced plans to send two more missile defense warships to Japan when he met his Japanese counterpart Itsunori on Odera in Tokyo. The U.S. ships would join five missile defense vessels already stationed in Japan. The move by Washington is apparently driven by North Korea's continued aggressive and provocative actions and its commitment to the defense of Japan and to treaty commitments. I can announce today that the United States is planning to forward deploy two additional Aegis ballistic missile defense ships to Japan by 2017. North Korea last month test fired two medium range ballistic missiles capable of hitting Japan. Tokyo has reportedly ordered its forces to destroy any North Korean ballistic missiles that pass through its airspace and has deployed its own Aegis vessel to the Sea of Japan. The U.S. defense chief who heads to China tomorrow called the world's second biggest economy a great power. But he warned that it must respect its neighbors or there will be conflict. China has been boosting its military spending and it's also becoming more assertive in territorial disputes. Hegel drew parallels between Russia's takeover of Ukraine's Crimea region to Japan and China's long dispute over the remote Diaoyu Islands in the East China Sea. I think we are seeing some clear evidence of uh, a lack of respect uh, and intimidation and coercion uh, in Europe today in what uh, the Russians have done in Ukraine. Um, we must be very c careful and we must be very clear, all nations of the world, that in the 21st century, uh, this will not stand. You cannot go around the world and redefine boundaries and violate territorial integrity and sovereignty of nations by force, coercion, and intimidation, whether it's in small islands in the Pacific or large nations in Europe. Still, Hegel said he looks forward to having an honest, straightforward dialogue with mainland officials to talk about ways the two nations and their militaries can work better together. Bolong, ATV News. Made employment agencies have been in the spotlight since an Indonesian domestic helper was found to have been violently abused by her employer in January. These agencies are now under heavy scrutiny in terms of how they operate and the quality of services. A survey conducted by the Hong Kong Catholic Commission for Labor Affairs found that employment agencies charge employers a wide range of recruitment fees, ranging from $1,000 to $9,000. But more than 75% of the employers interviewed by the group said they were not satisfied with the services provided by the agencies, and they think the government should regulate them more to prevent them overcharging. Survey organizer Law Poi Shan said that employment agencies do not have a standard charging system, so they can basically charge whatever they want. She thinks the government should consider using a penalty point system to monitor their operations and as a way of keeping their performance up to standard. 
Law added that the Labour Department should publish a list of all the licensed employment agencies and other relevant information to help the public. Meanwhile, there are reports that Ariana Subistianingsi, the abused Indonesian maid, is coming back to Hong Kong tomorrow to assist police in their investigation. Her spokesperson said she'll stay for a week. Former LegCo President Andrew Wong has called on the pan-democrats and Beijing to communicate more about political reform. Wong also said people should not see his proposal for civil recommendation as bowing down to Beijing. Emily Su reports. Before the consultation on political reform started, some of the pan-democrats were pushing the idea of civil nomination, letting ordinary voters name chief executive candidates for the 2017 election. But both Beijing and SAR officials have dismissed the idea since day one, saying it violates Article 45 of the Basic Law by undermining the nomination committee's sole authority to pick candidates, besides it being almost unheard of anywhere else in the world. So a group of scholars, including former LegCo President Andrew Wong, came up with another proposal. Under their plan, anyone who has the support of 2% of registered voters, or 70,000 people, could have their name put forward as a possible candidate. But to officially run for the 2017 election, the candidate would need the votes of one-eighth of the committee, according to the scholars. Wong today hit back at critics who say the proposal amounts to bowing down to Beijing. He insisted that proposing civil recommendation is not rebelling against the central government. There are many ways for us to choose from, Wong said, and different people prefer different ways. The way which may not seem the most legitimate may end up leading us to the finish line of achieving universal suffrage. Wong added that politics is all about discussion and communication, and said Beijing and the pan-democrats shouldn't stand too firm on their stances. He said it didn't matter whether talks between the two sides are public or private, as long as they continue. When asked about next weekend's trip by lawmakers to meet senior mainland officials in Shanghai, Wong agreed with pan-democrats that their meetings should be held separately from the pro-establishment camps. They are scared that the pro-government lawmakers will hog all the time and not allow them to express their views. At Misu, ATV News. Former Consumer Council head Connie Lau is confident about her new role as Ombudswoman, despite having not come from the civil service. Lau said not working for the government could even be an asset. Bo Leung reports. Newly appointed Ombudswoman Connie Lau has never worked for the government before, but she thinks her lack of experience could actually be an advantage. The former Consumer Council chief replaced Alan Lai as director of the Office of the Ombudsman this month, an independent watchdog overseeing public administration. Lau is the first non-civil servant to take over the post in 15 years. Lai and his predecessor Alice Tai were both retired civil servants. But speaking after a radio program today, Lau said she believes this won't be a problem and she'll be able to do her job without any external pressure. I think the most important attribute for the uh, ombudsman to possess is that you should be uh, very um, impartial and also you should be uh, a very uh, open-minded person to pursue. Instead of that, you are having certain experience in civil service. So uh, rather, I would say that because I do not possess that experience, I do not have the necessary uh, well, a burden onto my shoulder. After nearly four decades of fighting for consumer rights, Lau believes her background will help her act as the government watchdog. I think in the past, uh, uh, definitely the core value held by consumer council uh, will give me a lot of benefit uh, in my current uh, uh, task uh, as ombudsman. Uh, that is, uh, uh, you need to be transparent and you need to be fair and also you uh, need to be uh, impartial. So I think all this value added to me as a very good fundamental support to myself, how to run the Ombudsman office. Last year, the Ombudsman received more than 5,000 complaints and Lau hopes to streamline the process of handling grievances. Lau added there are plans to mediate smaller cases so it would free up staff to handle larger cases and investigations. Bo Leung, ATV News. Time now for sports with Raymond Yang.